follow the same looters and sponsors of values who control the political structures or encourage the formation of a new leadership team. Be a global citizen and join the radio revolution. The global village of conflicting ideologies and complexities, understanding systems and schemes through awareness and social reconstruction becomes expedient. They never told you how you offended them. I'm not on trial, so I can't go before. Join the, the radio man, Edmond Dobilo, on state affairs, the local and international politics, security, extensive economic analysis, interviews, and world power play. Nigerians must choose the part they want to follow. Follow the same looters and sponsors of values who control the political structures or encourage the formation of a new leadership team. Be a global citizen and join the radio revolution on state affairs. State affairs with Edmond Obilo. Radio just got deeper. State affairs with Edmond Obilo is live. Hey, what a good day here. What a beautiful moment to reflect on issues at the international stage. The program is State Affairs, coming from State Affairs Studios here in Ibadan. Today, we will be looking at the Israeli-Palestinian question. Are you following the story? Are you following the news? Are you seeing pictures of the devastation going on in Gaza? Did you follow the story of how Hamas invaded in Israel and killed more than a thousand Israeli. Israel is fighting back. Lives have been lost. It is about the unending Israeli-Palestinian conflict. When will it end? Is there no solution? If you look at some of the latest story coming from that region, Israel's military has updated the number of people it believes have been held hostage in Gaza. Israel is saying it's from 155 to 199 Israelis have been held hostage in Gaza. So I welcome you to this program. My name is Edmondo Pilo. Israel is saying that we are kidnapped when Hamas gunmen infiltrated Israel over a week ago. The figure coming from the Israelis is that more than 1,400 people were killed. More than 2,700 people in Gaza have been killed in retaliatory strikes by Israel. Israel is also blocking fear water, food, and medical supplies from entering the territory. The United Nations is saying it is deep in negotiations to get the first aid into Gaza. Israel's Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, and Hamas have denied earlier reports of a truce to allow some people out and aid in via the Rafa crossing. 
It is a dire situation there. So on this edition, on this class of politics and power, I want to take you back into time. I want to tell you a story. A story about the creation of Israel. The conflict of the day is a fallout of the creation of the state of Israel. So let's have that discourse. Let's have a clear picture of why we are where we are, of why we are where we are. Meanwhile, thousands of people have been gathering close to the crossing with Egypt in the hope of leaving Gaza ahead of an expected Israeli ground offensive. Is Israel planning to destroy Gaza? Is Israel planning to seize more lands with the ground offensive? United States Secretary of State Antony Blinken has returned to Israel on Sunday. Has, re has returned to Israel. Remember that on Sunday, the President of the United States, Joe Biden, called on Israel to exercise caution. Are you calling on Israel to exercise caution? So, let's delve into the issue. In this narrative I'm about to give, I will look at the Marshall Plan. I will talk about the Bafour Declaration. And I would mention a man who triggered the movement of Jews into Palestine. I'm, the I'm talking of Theodore Herz. This is a class of history, so calm down and listen as I break it down. I would also like to hear from you. You can leave your comments. You can call in. The number to call in is pinned to this post. And I would also recommend some books to you. Books that you can read to have a broader understanding of the world of the 21st century. But understanding the future also comes from understanding the past. The president of Nigeria, Bola Ahmed Tinubu, was in the United Nations not too long ago, where he delivered his first speech as the president of Nigeria at the General Assembly. In the speech, Tinubu called for a special attention to Africa. He called that Africa should be a development priority to the rest of the world. Let's listen to President Tinubu's speech. Then I will link it to the issues of the time. All right? So let's go back to the United Nations. Is to have any importance at all and any impact. Global institutions other nations and their private sector actor must see Africa as a development priority, not just for Africa, but in the interest of all's own as well. Due to both long-standing internal and external factors, Nigerians and Africans' economic structures 
have been skewed to impede development, industrial expansion, job creation, and the equitable distribution of wealth. I want you to look at us. In the aftermath of the Second World War, nations gather in an attempt to rebuild their war-torn societies. A few global systems was born, and this great body, the United Nations, was established as a symbol and protector of the aspiration and the finest ideas of humankind. Nations saw that it was in their own interest to help others exceed the rubbles and wasteland of war. Reliable and significant assistance allowed countries emaciated by war to grow into a strong and productive society. The period was a high water mark for trust in global institutions, and the belief that humanity had learned the necessary lessons to move forward in global solidarity and harmony. Today, for several decades, Africa has been asking for the same level of political commitment and devotion of resource that described the Marshall Plan. We realize that underlying conditions and causes of economic challenges facing today's Africa are significantly different from those of post-war Europe. We are not asking for identical programs and actions. What we seek is an equal firm commitment to partnership. We seek enhanced international cooperation with African nations to achieve the 2030 Agenda and Sustainable Development Goals. State Affairs with Edmond Dumbilo is live. Thus, President Bola Tinubu at the United Nations asking for Africa's type of Marshall Plan, feeling that Africa should be a development priority and the rest of the world should understand that and understanding that is coming out with a kind of design that he describes as Africa's kind of Marshall Plan. What is this Marshall Plan about? Remember, I am looking at the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, but the focus is on the creation of the State of Israel. Before Israel was created, the United States had a president called Roosevelt. Roosevelt was supposed to have led the United States into the Second World War, did he not? But he died at some point. He died before the end of the war. And his vice, Harry Truman, became the president of the United States. So why Roosevelt was in charge? He implemented to a good extent the Monroe Doctrine. The Monroe Doctrine at the time 
was a statement to check the recklessness of Germany. It was also a statement to prove America's power in the Western Hemisphere, in Latin America. The principles of the Monroy Doctrine also influenced that of Harry Truman. Just as under Truman, the focus was the Soviet Union. So under Truman, the attempt was bringing friendly nations under the defense umbrella of the United States of America. At this time, the United States has emerged as a global power. And its only competitor was the Soviet Union, now Russia. So under Harry Truman, there was the Truman Doctrine. It was a program of assistance worth $400 million extended to Greece and Turkey. But Western Europe needed a special intervention to revamp its ailing economy devastated by World War II. When I talk about Western Europe, I talk about Britain, I talk about France, you talk about Italy. These are countries of the West. At the end of World War II, they were weakened from the war. America became stronger after the war. Since they were weakened, they needed support. And America was there to provide the support. If the United States did not provide the support, what would have happened to Western Europe? With communist agents on rampage, an emergency program for Western, Western Europe would drive off communist domination through the toppling of capitalist movements. This would have been easy because of the desperation of Europeans to find jobs and eke out a living. You could see the way Africans are braving the Mediterranean, wanting to go into Europe in search of greener pastures. At the end of the war, World War II, Europeans were also desperate. They were ready to move into Russia just to survive. America didn't want that because Russia was a communist country while America was a capitalist country. Any attempt to allow the communist alternative would have given the people of Europe a choice of ideology. Are you with me in this class? The true man government initiated the Marshall Plan named after United States Secretary of State, George Marshall. Announcing the plan in 1947, Marshall said it was an exercise to help restart the European world on its way to recovery. So Tunubu wants that kind of plan for Africa. The point is that Western Europe needed to survive communist adventures for it to continue to buy United States product. The U.S. was manufacturing. It came out stronger. It came out becoming the biggest industrial power of the time. So it was producing. It needed people to buy the goods. And Europe was that market. But Europeans needed to be empowered to be able to spend. So nothing goes for nothing. You can see the strategy. Why am I discussing the Marshall Plan? 
I want to create a broader understanding of the Israeli question, and I will connect it as I go. Leave your comments. You can call the studio line at some point. The Marshall Plan, perhaps the most successful U.S. foreign policy, policy program in history, offered American military and economic assistance to promote free market economies with Europe. The program that was dispersed through the Economic Cooperation Act of 1948 eventually re-established Britain, France, West Germany to their great power status. The Marshall Plan concretely defined the Cold War and expanded America's influence in world politics. The formation of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, NATO, in April 1949, apparently confirmed the intention of the United States to apply its military power in defending its capitalist allies. If you look at the ongoing war between Russia and Ukraine, it was born with the Marshall Plan. It was there even before the Marshall Plan. But the Marshall Plan gave birth to NATO, and NATO is the biggest backer of Ukraine in the ongoing Russian-Ukrainian war. It's a subject of history. The radio man is discussing international affairs on state affairs. I'm giving you a background history of how the state of Israel was created, leading to the ongoing conflict between Israel and Palestine. Ulubi Yinka, thank you for watching. Kama or Lakunle Sonny, I'm happy to have you here. The Rock Multimedia, yes, the Rock Multimedia, thank you for always sharing the broadcast. We appreciate it. Thank you. You are helping to spread the program. Please don't give up. Ishola Akima Dituishi, good afternoon. Ishola says it's nice to be in class today. Yes, Ishola is also a political scientist. Thank you, Ishola, for joining the broadcast. Crown Michael says good afternoon. Crown Michael says Israel is on point, although it's a fight for territory. Akinwale Moses, I can see you. As we watch, let's also share. Let's leave our comments too. I would like to know what you think. Remember, it's a class of learners. We come here to learn and unlearn. Look at this. By banding together with the United States and Canada, Western Europe raised its defense confidence against the Soviet Union. In response, the Soviet Union led the countries of Eastern Europe to form a counter-defense alliance in the Warsaw Pact of May 1955. 
America led its allies to form NATO in April 1949. Soviet Union led its allies in Europe to form the Warsaw Pact in May 1955. The Warsaw Pact has collapsed. It collapsed with the collapse of the Soviet Union. But NATO is still around. Is NATO not the strongest alliance in the world today? That the war survived the scare of a nuclear standoff between the leaders of both blocs over the Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962 was more of a diplomatic tact rather than the willingness to go to war. Other events like the Berlin blockade, the Korean War, Vietnam War, for example, tested United States foreign policy during the Cold War. If there is one country I would like to visit, it is Vietnam. And I hope to be in Vietnam soon. As a student of international relations, I took deep interest in the Vietnam War. So it has always been my dream to travel to Vietnam in Asia. And I should travel to Vietnam soon. I want to see Vietnam. So the point I make is that the fallout of the Marshall Plan, the fallout of World War II, led to other events in world politics like the Berlin blockade, the Korean War. You know, the Korean War led to the division of Korea. Today we have South Korea and North Korea. Even the Vietnam War. The Vietnam War was a war between South Vietnam and North Vietnam. Remember the name Ho Chi Minh. To solidify United States military resolve for intervention anywhere in the world and to expand and protect its economic interest, the Britain Wood institutions were born. I'm talking about World Bank and IMF. The Accord Britain Wood institutions, they were born to protect the interest of the West. Are you with me? If you are with me, say something. Yes, you can see the phone line. It is pinned to this post. Let me hear your voice. If you are with me, share the broadcast. If you are with me, leave some comments. Let me know you are there. It's a class of politics and power. The objectives of Britain Wood institutions, or the main objective as the case may be, was to create an international monetary system to ensure the smooth operation of international transactions anchored basically on the concept of free trade. You know, when Tinubu came in, he wanted to show that he's liberal, that he believes so deeply in a free market economy. The reason, he says, let the market determine the prices of petroleum product. And he says, subsidy is gone. He says, let the naira float. Let market forces determine the value of naira. Now, naira exchanges for a dollar 
for more than a thousand naira. Free marketeers dance to the tune of the World Bank and International Monetary Fund. The establishment of the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development, that is another name for the World Bank, and the International Monetary Fund, was also meant to help the recovery effort in Europe. These institutions have since become the intellectual armory of the metropolitan countries in their well-orchestrated and now challenged capitalist globalization. So the events of the Cold War affected every part of the world, but for the purpose of this class, attention will be concentrated on the effect on the Middle East to explain U.S. foreign policy and the birth of the state of Israel. An example of what the Middle East was to become because of the foreign policy entanglement of the superpower read its ugly head in 1945. The fear of Nazi influence in the Middle East during World War II prompted Britain and the Soviet Union to agree to occupy Iran in 1941. Understand my drift. I'm just painting a picture of the world. That picture that led to the birth of Israel just painting that picture, that Israel was born as a result of intense international politics. But that politics started even before World War I. But it took that solid shape during the conflict of the World Wars. Remember, the wars were mainly the persecution of the Jews. Jews were scattered around the world. During the Second World War, more than six million Jews were killed. Remember the Holocaust. I'm not, a, I'm not in a hurry in this class. I don't have to finish the analysis today. That is why this studio was created to take time to dive deeper into issues bogging the world, giving it a broader understanding. That's why we are here. So I just talked about how Britain and the Soviet Union decided to say, let's take over Iran. And they did in 1941. The intention of their takeover was to protect Iran from Germany and secure supply lines to Russia. Both countries before the occupation agreed to pull out of Iran at the end of World War II. When the war ended in 1945, the Soviet Union reneged on the agreement. It went ahead to plant its foothold strongly in Iran. At that point, the United States had to confront the Soviet Union. And the Soviet Union reluctantly agreed to pull out of Iran in 1946, but not without extracting a concession from Iran. Can you see what politics? We will pull out, but Iran must do this before we go. The term of the pullout 
was the establishment of a joint Iranian-Soviet oil company to guarantee the, in the economic interest of the Soviet Union in the Middle East. Interesting. Okay, you can call the line. Let me hear from you. You can call the line. It is pinned to this post. I can also reel it to you. It, you call on WhatsApp. Call the line on WhatsApp. WhatsApp call. 0701294-1837. If you're outside the country, do not forget to add the country's International code, plus 234. That line is also the line of Udara Books. If you are interested in some of the books we recommend here, you can buy it on WhatsApp through that line. And the book of the day is this one, The Clash of Civilization. The Clash of Civilization. This is the book of the day. The Clash of Civilization, written by Samuel Hortington. That's the book of the day. I'll tell you about the book as we go. So just know the book of the day is entitled The Clash of Civilization. Okay. The United States confronted the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union left in 1946, but they extracted some dues from that negotiation. Resulting from the confrontation of Iran, the big powers embarked on policies to strengthen their positions in the Middle East. Can you see it? Resulting from the confrontation over Iran, the big powers embarked on policies to strengthen their positions in the Middle East. The creation of the State of Israel will go a long way in explaining the intentions and operations of United States foreign policy in the Middle East. So welcome to the creation of Israel. You see the map of Israel? You know, I always show you the map of Israel. Even the map of the United States, Britain. It's about world power politics. Now let's go into the creation of the state of Israel. And then you would understand why Hamas had to go and kill more than 1,300 Israelis to make a point. You would understand why Israel is bombing Gaza. Why Israel is planning a ground offensive. The agitation for a Jewish homeland had taken a political tone towards the end of the 19th century. Okay, I have a caller here. Hello. Hello. Good afternoon. Yes, good afternoon. Am I on with the radio man? Yes, you're on with the radio man. I think I'm speaking with you live. Yes, you are live. This is Abdurrahman Ajikiwi Ajini from Lagos. Okay, Abdurrahman, good to hear your voice. I love to be with you this afternoon. Thank you. You are a great man. Thank you. We need uh, more people like you to educate the
the youth to give them directive how to move and when to move and what to do because education is very important in life. Thank you. And uh, that is the, rebel, uh, the, the, the thing you are doing that we are learning. Once we know about things to do, we won't be of a slave to such events. So I so much appreciate and I thank you a lot. Thank you for calling. Thank you. We appreciate you too. The issue of uh, Palestine and uh, Israel. I think that is what you are discussing about. Yes. The little I can say about it is this. It's my own uh, little knowledge. Your long post. Hello? Yes, I can hear you. Make your point. Yeah. The issue of Israelites and Palestine, we keep on managing the crisis because of it. Why I say this is this. We need the truth, facts about the conflicts occurring in that event. But which the truth and the fact is very difficult to establish now. The little history I know about that area, primarily the Jewish people, they were emanates from uh, Adam, uh, uh, sorry, from Abraham. That is their predecessor. We have Abraham, we have Lut. The Lot people reside in Palestine. Why Abraham stay very close to Palestine? That was their tendencies. As the time goes on, you see, uh, I, 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 you, you uh, Abdul Rahman, just make it brief, okay? Okay. Yes, just make it's it brief. The, the, the brief I want to say about the issue is this. Mm. Yeah, we keep on managing the crisis, the counts of the crisis. Underneath, it is a religion's issue. The Jewish and the Muslim there. The Jewish, they are fighting for Muslims like Aqsa, and the Palestinians, they don't want to give it out. The Jewish people are claiming to be the originality owner of that Muslim Laksa. Why the Palestinians, I claim that they have been worshipping, being the Muslim in that uh, Muslim Laksa, they won't leave it. All right. It's just the simple thing that I understand about it. Thank so you. So it is an underneath religious issue. They can't solve it until Jesus Christ came back to come and solve the issue for them. All Thank right. you very much, sir. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that call. So I'm giving you historical analysis of the creation of Israel and the birth of the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. I make the point that the agitation for our Jewish homeland had taken a political tone towards the end of the 19th century. This coincided with the weakening of the powers of the Ottoman Empire. At the time, the Ottoman Empire controlled the Middle East and a large swath of territories in Europe and Africa. The heart of the Ottoman Empire is the country presently known as Turkey. The Ottoman Empire was like a Soviet Union that also collapsed. It controlled countries today known as Saudi Arabia, Iran, the Arab world, and some parts of Europe were under the Ottoman Empire.
1896 strongly worded statement from the Austrian Jewish journalist Theodor Herz was a fierce statement about the mission of Zionist forces to create a state for themselves. The Zionists are also Jewish, so I can call them Zionist forces or Jewish forces. Let's look at the statement, the statement that gave birth to the state of Israel. You know, sometimes don't underrate the power of words. When this journalist called Theodore Herz made this statement, it later gave life to the state of Israel like we have it today. So let's look at the statement he made. He says, I do not intend to arouse sympathetic emotions on our behalf. That would be foolish, futile, and undignified proceeding. I shall content myself with putting the following questions to the Jews. So he starts. Is it not true that in countries where we live in, in countries where we live in perceptible manners, the position of Jewish lawyers, doctors, technicians, teachers, and employees of all descriptions becomes daily more intolerable. Is it not true that the Jewish middle classes are seriously threatened? You can see, Jews were threatened in Europe. Jews were innovative. In Germany, why did Hitler go for them? They were innovative. They were good in business. They were good in science. So they were rich. And others were jealous of them. They were attacked. They have been endangered species. And when Hells could not take it anymore, he began to campaign, asking Jews, uh, asking Jews, for how long are we going to continue to take this? Perhaps Theodore knew that something like the Holocaust was coming. I think the Holocaust was the last straw for the Jews. In that statement, he makes the point, is it not true that the passions of the mob are incited against our wealthy people? Is it not true that our poor endure greater sufferings than any other poor? He makes the point, that this kind of pressure is being felt everywhere by Jews. He now makes the point, are we going to get out of these countries now? And where do we go to? He asked the question. May we yet remain? And how long? Theodore says, let the sovereignty be granted us over a portion of the globe large enough to satisfy the rightful requirement of a nation. The rest we shall manage for ourselves. Hello, Mr. Chukwemeka Izundu. Uh, good, good afternoon, Mr. Gilman. Yes, good afternoon. Yeah, Mr. Chukwemeka calling from England. All right, the ball is in your court. 
I'm listening to you. I'm in the class. Sitting down on, uh, lying down on my bed, listening to the cold voice and writing down some points from the lecturer, who is Mr. Obila. But uh, my own contribution towards this, because I was listening to the last caller, is that we are, and I want to ask the question first, where is Africa in the decision making of the West or in the world? We are nowhere to be found. It amazes me how an African man who has no food, who is struggling to have one day um, a, a square meal, is trying to protest or bringing biblical translation or uh, uh, which adjective should I use to qualify this? to sympathize with foreign policies of the Europe and Americans. As long as I'm concerned and I live in England, the Europe and the Americans protect their interests. And as long as America is concerned and they want to take over and they want to keep, they want to still maintain the power, the world power. Israel must be there because Israel is a watchdog to the Arab world. They use Israel to spy other countries. They found Israel, they created Israel, and Israel is America. It's an extension of United King, the United States of America. Nigerians should concentrate on how to develop their nation. Our religious leaders should remove their hands, like the one of the pastors who is making uh, who made a video preaching that God is doing this. Remove God, remove emotion. It's a man mad. They have given up, given us Bible, convincing us, taking the um, the. Uh, the common wealth in the uh, in the Palestinian land or Israel is Israeli soil to develop their people. People are using sympathy to talk because this is an issue of Muslim and Christian. No, it is a case of or it is a game of who is in charge, and as long as America is in charge, there is nothing anybody can do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate this call. Yes, I like it when I hear from you. The line is open. It's a class of learners. I learn too from your perceptions. It's a discourse. Giving you a historical background of the creation of the State of Israel. At the moment, I'm analyzing the words of Theodore Herz. He was the one who openly called for the creation of a state for Jews in 1896. In that statement, he says the creation of a new state is neither ridiculous nor impossible. We have in our day witnessed the process and connection with nations, he says. How did Palestine then become the choice for the creation of the state of Israel? The choice of Palestine as a homeland for the Jews created a problem of immense complexity owing to the refusal of the Arabs to accept a Jewish state in what they call their land. Inspired by Western nationalism, thousands of Jews in Europe began to migrate to Palestine to join their fellow Jews who were minority at the time in Palestine. 
There were Jews in Palestine before they called by hands for others to join. So who owns Palestine? Just ponder on that. I don't intend to answer that question here. By 1914, when World War I started, a sizable number of Jews had migrated to Palestine. The defeat of the Ottoman Empire, already in the horizon by 1917, put Britain at the hems of Palestinian affairs. Can you see? The Ottoman Empire was in charge of the Arab world. When the Ottoman Empire collapsed, it was the rise of Britain in that zone. And Britain, at the collapse of the Ottoman Empire, took charge of Palestine. British forces, under General Sir Edmund Allenby, defeated the Turks and captured Jerusalem on the 9th of December, 1917. And that was towards the end of World War II, of World War I. The Ottoman Empire collapsed in the middle of World War I, and it led to the rise of European powers. In 1922, the League of Nations officially granted Britain the mandate to govern Palestine. There was the League of Nations before the United Nations. It was the reform of the League of Nations that gave birth to the United Nations. Yes, there was this super speech. I want you to see the picture of Winston Churchill. Ayo, can we see the picture of that former British Prime Minister, Winston Churchill? Because I want to talk about him. There's this biography of Winston Churchill. I thought I was going to bring it here. If you are a lover of politics... I implore you to read books. I implore you to read books. Some part of what I am talking about today, we're part of my BSc thesis when I studied uh, politics and international relations at the BSc level. Because my, I've always loved international affairs. So I looked at the Middle East. I've always been interested in the Middle East. So part of what I'm reading today, I extracted from my thesis during my BSc days studying politics and international relations. And when I was looking at it again, I said, okay, perhaps I need to publish that thesis now as a book. Because most of the predictions I made there years ago are reflecting today I'm wondering, why haven't I published this as a book? Anyway, my books will start coming out soon. It's because I've been recommending other books. But you should also begin to read me soon and critique me too. Don't forget the book of the day, Clash of Civilization. That's the book of the day. I will tell you about it. So, Winston Churchill. In 1922... The League of Nations officially granted Britain the mandate to govern Palestine. Winston Churchill's 1921 speech that Zionism was also good for the Arabs who lived in Palestine hit at the core of Arab pride. Are you getting the point? When Winston Churchill went to Jerusalem to make that speech in 1921, he advised the Arabs in Palestine to consider 
Jewish consciousness. There is something positive in it. You know, calling on Arabs to share in the benefits and progress of Zionism was a rhetorical way of pushing aside Arab consciousness. Did they see it coming? You know, the last scholar was saying Israel was planted there. Ha, planted. Okay, let's continue to see. Church's speech supported the equitable division of Palestine and its resources to the Jews and Arabs to fulfill their nationalism. The church was saying, you can divide the resources and land among the Jews and the Arabs living in Palestine. A critical analysis of Winston Church's 1921 speech in Jerusalem at the Hebrew University was a revelation of Britain's more concern for a prosperous Jewish state. According to Churchill, the establishment of a Jewish national home in Palestine will be a blessing to the world. Is Churchill right? Look at the word. He said, I'm quoting him now. The establishment of a Jewish national home in Palestine will be a blessing to the world. So is it a blessing to the world? He made that statement in 1921. Statements like these coming from British politicians few years after the country reneged on the Hossein McMahon Agreement instigated Arab public opinion against Western influence in the Middle East. I don't know if you've read about the Hussein McMahon agreement that Britain reneged on in the Middle East. Look at this book. The Supreme Commander, The War Years of Dwight Eisenhower. The Supreme Commander. Have you read this book? I recommend this book to you. You will find this book on udarabooks.com. And you can also buy it on, through this line. The number pinned to this post, you can buy it on that line. You can buy it. That is Udara Books' WhatsApp number. It's also the studio line. So if you are interested in this work, this tells you about World War II and the general that led the war. And after the war, this general became the president of America. He resigned from the army and became the president of the United States of America. So America has also been governed by a general, like Buhari was a general in the army. I can say who I was a general. The supreme commander, that was how he was addressed during World War II. It's a very interesting book. So you'll find it on udarabooks.com. What did he say? Ambrose brings Eisenhower's experience of the Second World War to life in this book, showing in vivid detail how the general's skill as a diplomat and military strategist contributed to Allied successes in North Africa, in Europe, and established him as one of the greatest military leaders in the world. The author of the book is Stephen Ambrose, the Supreme Commander. All these are old books. You can hardly find them. I just brought them out from the archives. I know we have just three copies of this because it has been in the archives. They are not new books. They are old books. You can hardly find them. So you can find them on the darabooks.com. Yes, let me see some comments here. Omotayo Lua wrote me on Nobamiro says, Edmund, if they give Africans 
any sort of Marshall Plan, the people in Africa will embezzle it. It says African leaders who will embezzle the funds. Africans need mind education first to reorientate their thinking. Thank you. Habila Obed, happy you are watching live from Lagos. Thank you. Olado Kunfemi Manuel, happy to have you here. Ogechuku Aguike is watching from Germany. He says, keep it up. Thank you. Opola Sunshine. Thank you for joining the broadcast. Hey, I can see Yemi's showing car. The author of Yemi's diary is watching. Have you read that book? Yemi's diary? It is the story of a young girl going through the pains of life. What a story she told there. Yemisi, thank you for joining the broadcast. I can see Raman Adini. Yes, Raman, you called. Thank you for calling, Raman, and thank you for being there. Obina Dennis Nguizu. Yes, it's about history. It's about time. I was talking about the Hussein McMahon agreement that Britain did not keep. It was like a betrayal of the Arab world. So what was the agreement about? It was a reassurance by Britain that it will support the creation of a unified Arab state if Arabs joined in the fight against the Ottoman Empire. Are you getting it? The Ottoman Empire was like colonizing other Arab nations. So Britain convinced Arabs to join forces with it to fight the Ottoman Empire. That after the collapse of the Ottoman Empire, there will be, there will be the creation of a united Arab state. But at the fall of the Ottoman Empire, Britain did not keep to the terms of that agreement. Joining forces with Britain and other Western armies, the Arabs helped to defeat the Ottomans. Britain reneged on the terms of the agreement. In 1916, Britain signed the Psyche Peacock Agreement with France. Hey, you see Europe? <laughs> Look at this agreement. As a student of politics, take note of this. There was the Hussein McMahon Agreement that Britain did not keep. It deceived the Arab world, the Arab world. At the fall of the Ottoman Empire, a United Arab State was not created. Instead, Britain went to sign an agreement with France known as the Psychis Peacock Agreement. What was that agreement about? They divided Arab territories among themselves. They now colonized the Arab world. They removed the first colonizer, Ottoman Empire and now became the colonizers. They divided the Arab world among themselves, Britain and France, the way they divided Africa. Remember the scramble for Africa? Ah, what politics is about interest? So there was also the scramble for the Arab world. Dividing Arab territories among themselves in a renewed effort to colonize countries of the Arab world. This culminated in the lack of trust that surrounds Western and Arab dealings till date. Supporting the creation of a Jewish state further pushed the divide, creating uneasy tension in the Arab world. The first wave of Jewish migration to the Ottoman-governed Palestine began in 1881, 
before Theodore Hell's statement. The conflict in Europe at the time made Jews victims of persecution, thus putting them order under intense pressure to create a state of their own, where their survival and identity will be guaranteed. After Hell's statement, more Jews embarked on the journey to Palestine, swelling their number to about 40,000 by 1914, when World War I started. Jewish contribution to Britain during the war was rewarded with the Balfour Declaration of 1917. The British Foreign Secretary, Otto Balfour, in the declaration states that His Majesty's government favored the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people and will use their best endeavors to facilitate the achievement of this project. Are you getting the point? Britain wanted the creation of a Jewish state in Palestine and it was made clear in the Balfour Declaration of 1917 before Winston Churchill went to Jerusalem to make that point that angered the Arab world. Did they not see it coming? Hey, welcome to my world. Welcome to the radio man's world. We are streaming from State Affairs Studio in Ibadan. We are talking to the world. Tell your friends about the show. At the moment, we run the shows on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday from this studio. That is 2 p.m. West African time. Though today we started behind schedule. 2 p.m. West African time. We have not officially opened the studio, but we've officially started broadcast. Right? At least we have seen that the lights are working well, that the microphones are fine, that the cameras are getting the right pictures. We'll bring in guests sometimes, but today it is just me. I'm not bringing in any guests. I'm giving you the product of my research. Yes, the Balfour Declaration, or to Balfour, British Foreign Secretary, made the declaration. The statement he made was the legitimization of Zionism and the acceptance of a national orientation that would further trigger strict Arab resistance. Arabs saw the Balfour Declaration as a Western ploy to dominate the territories of the Middle East by planting its ally in their territories. Is it their territory? Is it a strange land to Israel? Were Jews not in that land before? Who owns the land? I will address that subject on another edition. I'm taking it one story at a time. So the Jews, the Arabs became angry about the declaration by before. So in 1920, there was the Palestine riots. The Jews convinced of their aspiration formed the Haganah militia. You know, today you have what you call Hamas. Israel says Hamas is a terrorist group fighting in the interest of Palestine. Before the creation of Israel, Israel also formed what its own Hamas called the Haganah. Are you getting me? The Haganah. The Haganah operated like today's Hamas. Hey... The Jews, convinced of their aspiration, formed the Haganah militia, 
which later gave birth to the militant groups known as the Igun and Lehi. These groups formed the defense force of the Jews against the Arabs. Western influence and support was paramount in the establishment of the State of Israel. The granting to Britain a mandate over Palestine by the League of Nations would not have happened in the absence of Europe's control of the League of Nations. It was the sharing of the booty by the victorious forces after a war, though with an understanding of the position of the Arabs. The Balfour Declaration therefore took into cognizance the need to create a Palestinian state for Arabs while projecting the right of the Jews to also have their, own, their, their homeland. Jewish migration to Palestine continued to increase despite efforts by Britain to limit it. You know, Britain wanted to handle it calmly. But the number of Jews that were now flooding into Palestine became uncontrollable and Britain wanted to stop it. They said, no, take it easy. So what happened? Yes. I have made this point that the rise of the Nazis in Germany led to the persecution of Jews in Europe and they wanted their own homeland and they began to move in into Palestine. This was the major cause of the revolt that led to the killing of more than 5,000 Arabs by British authorities in Palestine. As the Jews were moving in, Arabs began to demonstrate and fight back, and British soldiers could not help it, and about 5,000 Arabs were killed. But this dampened the zeal of the Arabs to fight back. Britain in 1939 imposed a restriction on the state migration of Jews into Palestine. Britain could not take it anymore. Seen enough. This brought Britain in confrontation with the Jewish militants who resisted the move and began the smuggling of Jews into Palestine to swell their population there. Caught in the middle of Jewish-Arab resistances, Britain, after World War II, took the Palestine question to the United Nations to answer. The United Nations, on the 15th of May 1947, resolved to create the United Nations Special Committee on Palestine to prepare a report on the crisis. The committee recommended a placement. The committee recommended the replacement of the British mandate with an independent Arab state, an independent Jewish state, and the city of Jerusalem to be under an international trusteeship system. Are you getting the point? In 1947, the United Nations recommended that an independent Arab state should be created, an independent Jewish state to be created, and that Jerusalem that is always a source of problem should now be under an international trusteeship system. Did the Arabs agree to the recommendation or resolution of the United Nations? On 29th November 1947, the United Nations 
in Resolution 181, Subsection 2, Partitioned Palestine, as recommended by its committee. The Jews accepted the plan, but the Arab rejected it. The Jews accepted, but the Arabs said no, that they want everything, that you cannot divide Palestine. That notwithstanding, the state of Israel was declared on the 14th of May, 1948, after the expiration of the British mandate. Immediately, the state of Israel was declared. Arab countries of Egypt, Jordan, Syria, and Iraq, with the support of other Arab nations, invaded Israel leading to a major war that Israel successfully executed. Other major wars with the Arab world came in 1956, 1967, and 1973 on the same Palestine question, leading Israel to capture the West Bank, Golan Heights, Gaza, and the Sinai Peninsula. Israel has superior weaponry, and if you saw how Israel built its weaponry, you would be amazed that if there is a will, there is always a way. How the small Israel was able to take on the whole Arab world. So whenever they, they won the 1956 war, and it grabbed more land. Won in 1967, grabbed more land. Won in 1973, grabbed more land. And this time, they will grab land again. And Palestine, the Arabs keep losing. Now, you know, when they grabbed the first land, they chased out the Arabs. So today, if you go to the border of Egypt now, you see about one million Palestine, the Arabs. Israel, Israel has driven them out of Gaza. So Israel will take more land. Huh. More than 700,000 indigenous Palestinians were expelled from the territories under Israeli occupation. You know, I told you Israel took the West Bank, Golan Heights, Gaza, and Sinai Peninsula. I think at some point they returned to Gaza. Though territories like Gaza, the Sinai Peninsula have been handed over to the Arabs, Israel's development of the settlements in other captured territories remains a sore point in the negotiation between Palestine and Israel. It leaves Arab consciousness at the mercy of Jewish, of Jewish vision. Zionist ideas propelled by hands in 1896 has become that broad Jewish idea. It represents the common interests of Jewish moderates, radicals, extremists, and they are expressing it in the war against Hamas. I'll leave it there until another time when I come with another story on Israel. Look at this book. The Clash of Civilizations and the Remaking of World Order. In 1993, Foreign Affairs magazine published an article entitled The Clash of Civilization. And that article was written by a Harvard professor, Samuel Hortonton. According to the journal's editors, the article went on to generate more discussion than anything they had published since the Second World War. It is that article that gave birth to this book. It tells you about the clash between Arab world, Islam, and other religion. This book talks about the birth of Al-Qaeda, ISIS, Hamas, Hezbollah, 
It talks about Boko Haram. Not in the terms of Boko Haram, but what will give birth to Boko Haram. It's a classic. I recommend this book to you. Get a copy from darabooks.com. Another book I think you should read. Are you a Muslim? How often do you read? Because I also discovered some of my Muslim friends don't even have clear history of Islam. They just go to the mosque and pray. They don't have details of the religion, really. Look at this work. Look at this book, Islam. If you read this book, you and it's not just for Muslims, because I'm not a Muslim, but I bought it to read. Why reading it? I said, oh, we must have this in Udara Bookstore. So we went to look for it. So we have about 25 copies now. Get this book. It is a comprehensive guide to the history, philosophy, and practice of Islam around the world with more than 500 beautiful illustrations. It is an in-depth history of the Islamic faith from Allah's revelations to Muhammad in the 7th century to the thriving Muslim world of the 21st century. This book is a classic. I will continue to recommend it. Islam. If you are a Christian, you should read it. If you love knowledge, read it. I'm not religious, but I read religious books to understand why people do the things they do. And I keep reading this work again and again. Now you also see what you call the golden age of Islam. The science of Islam. I recommend this to you. You can buy it on the WhatsApp number pinned to this broadcast. Or you can go on udarabooks.com. Yes, another book I think will help you in your understanding of world politics. Is this autobiography entitled Duty, Memoirs of a Secretary at War, Robert Gates? Here, this book is like a book on American foreign policy. It's Robert Gates telling his story. He's a former defense secretary of the United States. So as a defense secretary, he tells you his role in the Iraq war. His role in formulating American foreign policy. Get a copy on udarabooks.com. Duty. Classic. Classic. You know, I, I quoted from this book during my BSc thesis. I quoted a lot from this book. That was when I bought the book. We still have about four copies on udarabooks.com. Yes, I brought you another beautiful book. The Politics Book. The Politics Book. Who wants to read the Politics Book? I recommend this book to you. Read it and improve your knowledge of world politics. It's about knowledge. It's about analysis. The Politics Book. Let me see. Tells you about Napoleon Bonaparte. Remember about Napoleon Bonaparte, the man that hijacked the French Revolution. It tells you about a tendency to attack the family. It's a symptom of social chaos. Beautiful illustrations. Good books. The politics book. Hey, so when is the next broadcast? Wednesday by 2 p.m. Where will I be by 2 p.m. on Wednesday? I know Wednesday's a busy time, but um, 2 p.m. on Wednesday. Let's have a date. I'm Edmondo Pilo. Thank you for listening, and thank you for always being there. State Affairs with Edmond Nobilo is live.